We are here today with Sorab Amari uh, to discuss his new book, Tyranny, Inc., How Private Power Crushed American Liberty and What to Do About It. So Sorab is the founder and editor of Compact Magazine, which, very broadly speaking, aims to form something of a union between people of various political stripes to pursue the common good. He previously was an op-ed editor with the New York Post, and before that, he was a columnist and editor with the Wall Street Journal. He's written three books prior to this one, The New Philistines, How Identity Politics Disfigures the Arts, From Fire by Water, My Journey to the Catholic Faith, and The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos. I first met Sorab in 2019, I think, when I approached him after one of his debates with David French. This one was at Notre Dame. I asked him to sign my copy of From Fire by Water. He didn't know me at the time, but we got to know each other through the years, and I'm now fortunate to call him a friend. So, Sorab, thank you so much for your time. We're really happy to talk with you about your new book, Tyranny, Inc., How Private Power Crushed American Liberty and What to Do About It. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Very kind of you. No, this is this is going to be great. Like I said, this was a fantastic book. Really happy to work through it with June and bounce ideas off of her as we were reading it. And it really defied, even having read your previous books, it really defied a lot of my, uh, I guess, expectations um, going into it, but all for the better. So just real broadly from the beginning, and you touch on this throughout the book, but what prompted you to write this book at this time? I mean, having read your previous books, it's something of a departure. So what went into this? Basically, why this book and why now? Sure, sure. And it is it is somewhat of a departure, although in some ways it's in continuity with The Unbroken Thread. We can get into that as well. But mm -hmm. um, so this book was conceived on election night 2020 um, before it was clear that um, uh, it was clear that Trump had lost the election. Um, I went to bed thinking he'd won at that point. But um, and so did many others. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, but, but, but one thing was clear, right? The result was still kind of muddy, but one thing was clear. That was that, um, that the Republican party in its Trumpian iteration had, um, consolidated its, um, working class gains from 2016. That is in 2016, um, you know, remarkable shares of, of working class people, including the largest share of union households for a GOP nominee since Ronald Reagan had voted for Trump. And that was crucial to Trump winning um, in places like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. But that was largely the white working class. This time around in 2020, it was clear that he had uh, made huge inroads to what became known in a kind of popular buzzword uh, on the right or the populist right is the work multiracial working class. So right. it was kind of a euphoric night, actually. Um, and then uh, so soon after that, I went to my editors at Random House and I pitched this book that would be a kind of manifesto for a uh, working class GOP. Uh, a, a, a GOP that was at least as concerned with the well-being of wage earners as it is with the concerns and needs and demands of the asset uh, the, of the asset rich few, and they were sold, and that's the basis on which the book was actually like the the deal was consummated. But then I set about actually kind of doing reporting about okay, so what you know what is what is holding back. Uh, what are the main obstacles to working class flourishing? Um, some of them were cultural, as a color of cultural conservative like me had long suspected and argued. Uh, um, but a lot of them had to do with economic issues and specifically with the coercion, the unjust coercion that pervades market life in our lives as workers and consumers. And to these, uh, the Republican Party had no real answer or solution even in its kind of more populist um, kind of uh, iteration or uh, version. And so what I ended up instead writing is more of a reportorial book that gives readers a tour of our political economy to today as it's experienced by people toward the bottom. Um, and, you know, we see coercion, which we usually, you know, we're conditioned to think of coercion as something only government does when in fact we're, um, faced with coercion all the time in the private economy. And I show this in, for example, um, workplace uh, scheduling precarity for workers on the lower rungs of the labor market, especially the huge service economy that you know takes up 
a huge chunk of our economy in um, workplace contracts, in the way that workplace agreements are structured in a way that they can silence uh, whistleblowers, they can subject employees to near total surveillance of their online activities. Right. Um, in the abuse of commercial arbitration, which we can get into, but something that's meant for merchants of relatively equal bargaining power is increasingly now used to prevent workers from bringing their grievances to regular traditional courts, uh, right. you know, basically barring actual justice for workers and so on. So I do that in the first half of the book. And in the second half, I ended up writing more of a kind of economic history, very broad, obviously, because this is a relatively short book. So Lincoln's uh, address to the Wisconsin Agricultural Society, which many historians believe is this kind of definitive moment in the rise of a, a certain kind of Whig or Republican view of the political economy, which has been definitive in the United States ever since, to the New Deal era and the sort of 30 years after the, uh, World War II when things were as good as if they've right. been yeah. for American workers, and then ending with the neoliberal era, the, the era that we find ourselves in, which kind of takes us back to the pre-reform 19th century. So that's the, the book that ended up actually being written as opposed to the sort of rah-rah manifesto that I initially pitched. So there's a kind of a story in the back, a backstory to the book, which I think might be interesting to readers. I guess at first, you know, after you see the results of that election, take the wind out of the sails, sort of the sense of triumph is gone. But I think it, the, the story you tell in part two of the book is, well, in a sense, it's infuriating, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's disheartening. Uh, and I guess real quick, just to piggyback off of what you said, because like you said, there's this real allergy in America to admitting of, of, of coercion in any private space. Uh, in, in, in the employer-employee context because there's this fiction or this myth that, oh, well, employers and employees are of equal bargaining power in theory, right? That, well, employers can always hire new employees to fill their slots. And that still is largely true. But on the other side of the equation, it's theorized, of course, that the employees can just, well, they can go to any other employer. But they're not exactly equal. I mean, to, to say that to an employee who can cannot afford to, to miss a paycheck for two weeks or a month, uh, who requires it quite literally to eat. Right? It's, they're not exactly analogous positions, and that's where theory falls flat. And uh, so I think that theory gets you only so far. And so I think that that was a really uh, good articulation of that. Well, thank you. And uh, you're, what you just articulated, and I know you disagreed with it, but what you just articulated is the theoretical uh, backbone of the of the model of liberty of contract right which was um obviously used that that concept was used to strike down all sorts of workplace protections and workers rights uh in the pre-new deal era in the late 19th century and the first few decades of the 20th century um and it's made a comeback today uh in, in a much more sort of subtle and insidious way liberty of con contract has come back and the idea is that basically that employer employee relations are uh on their own generally optimal and therefore there should be no sort of external intervention because as you said there's this symmetry so they both have a symmetrical right to join of join a contract with each other to form a contract with each other and they both have a symmetrical right to walk away and of course uh that's that that's true in i guess in a sort of very abstract theoretical way but it, as you said it's it's just not how the real life labor markets and real life lives of ordinary people work. So for example, I give the story of this Ernst & Young employee uh, who you know, had been employed for some time at Ernst & Young. And then one day the, the firm sent an email saying, you know, if you show up to work the next day, you agree to give up your right to sue us in a regular court. You have to go through this arbitration exactly. process, which we design, which we structure. Um, and where you're less likely to, much less likely to prevail than you would be in a regular court. Um, at that point, according to the kind of laissez-faire liberty of contract theory, at that point, the worker had a, the, the ability to either renegotiate or to walk away from the employment agreement. <laughs> and that, that meant that he has symmetrical power with Ernst & Young. In reality, most people just show up because they, they show up to work the next day because they got to pay the bills. Like they have to 
pay for food, like you said, and take care of elderly parents and have health insurance and so on. Yeah, and so, even you know, and even if he actually exercises his power, okay, go to Deloitte, go to KPMG, where you'll encounter largely the exact same situation. It's an illusion of choice, even if he were to exercise that power. Correct. Just very quickly, I mean, that's another issue with, with this is that um, uh, m most most markets in the United States, and this has been the case since the late 19th century, are characterized by what's called oligopoly. That is not that they're monopolies where just one um, one seller or whatever, one producer um, wields uh, enormous power and kind of dominates entirely, but rather there's just a few firms that dominate uh, whatever the given industry. Um, the, ef uh, the effect of that is that in any given labor market, you have many, many employees going up against a very relatively few employers and that's one of the key reasons why um uh, walking away really doesn't make conditions better by the way adam smith who's the sort of godfather of laissez-faire theory acknowledged this in i think book three of the wealth of nations he says you know it's true that in theory um each needs the other meaning employer and employee both need the other but under most circumstances, the, the employer or the boss can live off his exactly. profits because of the way profits are distributed in, in the in the labor uh, relationship. He can live off the profits for a, a, like a year, whereas right. the worker can scarcely survive a, you know, a day, a week without work. So although the two, two do need each other in the it, in the immediate course of things, it's the laborer who's much more dependent on, on on the employer than the other way around. So before I met Yuda and before he brought me to the Steubenville conference, I had no idea like this kind of section of the right existed. Um, more or less people who actually like care. <laughs> um, to me, the right was just like George Bush, Sean Hannity, you know, like the libertarians on Twitter talk about like child slave labor and... Um, I guess the populists who sometimes have good rhetoric, but that rhetoric always is sort of fake, falls flat. Um, but you're actually, your speech um, that I saw and your book are just really refreshing because you could tell that you actually do care and you're passionate about it. It's not just like a grift or an appeal to populist rhetoric. Like you actually talk about coercion, um, collective bargaining, unionization. You praise social democracy a few times in this book, which is the ideology I think I would align with the most. Um, but I posted a photo of me holding the book onto my Instagram page um, about like a month ago, and I got a reply. Well, most of the replies are like, oh, cool, like, I'll check it out. But I got one reply that was like, oh, look, another book about corporations going woke, like, pass. Um, so my question is, like, how would you sell your book to a person like that? Like, sometimes, uh, like, a person more like, internet brain, the lifestyle leftist, as you call them, who's more like hesitant to read something from a conservative because they're so used to conservatives only doing like the very vapid criticism of corporate power where it's just like, oh, Bud Light has gone woke. So like, how would you kind of sell this to a more left wing liberal audience? Yeah, that's a really, 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 really good question, June. And the answer is, is, is sort of in the book where I repeatedly um, take issue with and criticize the style of what I call neo-populism yeah. that um, only focuses on corporate power as a sort of, um, as an, as a cultural issue. That is, yeah. a, um, you know, Disney can coerce its employees or consumers in this or that way having to do with ideology, but then like, otherwise though, like, you know, Disney deserves every tax break and should be yeah. able to do with its workers as it pleases. I explicitly mm -hmm. take that on and I, call it out as a kind of, as you said, like a kind of fake populism. Um, and it, it, it is an enormous frustration with me. And so the the reason I, I focus on the issue of coercion, per se, mm -hmm. of private coercion, is precisely I, I tell people on the right that like, you know, if you if you have a problem with Disney or any employer ideologically coercing its employees, whatever the ideology may be, the best way to mit ameliorate that or to be the best way to mitigate that is just to raise up workers countervailing power and so that you know then you know whatever the ideology may be workers are able to to resist that and people aren't aren't fired for not believing whatever the ideology of the moment would be would be whether it's like elon thought or 
you know, Disney's um, wokeism, right? And so I think that's a, such a clear difference from the kind of fake populism that I readily admit does exist. And I, I criticize yeah. it all the time. I've become very, very, uh, very frustrated with it because I, 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 I know some of these people. In fact, I consider some of them still my allies. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, whenever this these kinds of issues come up, um, first of all, they have a kind of fake idea of what the working class is, which is um, typically a almost like a sort of a roofer who owns his own business. <laughs> it's a kind of small businessman. Mm -hmm. It's largely, I have to say, it's a kind of racialized image. Mm -hmm. um, and so like what the actual working class is like, which is lots of precarious college holding people mm -hmm. who nevertheless deserve to have health care and not live in such precarious conditions. It includes like Filipina ladies who work in hospitality. Mm -hmm. It includes lots of people who don't fit that image. I try to challenge that by showing, you know, people on the right what current what the current working class is like. And if you want to support it, as you say you do, um, you have to take it for what, it, what it's actually like. Yeah. Um, and then to challenge this kind of culturalism, right, where it, it, it's all cashing out as, you know, a combination of, yes, like rail against corporations for doing this and that at the level of culture. But at the same time, you're still basically a libertarian when it comes to political economy. Yeah, like you said uh, in the book, um, the cultural left and right kind of have this like symbiotic relationship. A corporation will change its logo to be like rainbow. And then, you know, it gives the left that kind of fake feeling of progress and it gives the right like outrage clicks like they get to like um, mutually they get something out of it. And meanwhile, the corporation can still be like on um, behind closed doors getting support from mostly like uh, Republican politicians and stuff like that. And that was a really, really good point that. I like the part where it's just like, oh, yeah, they get clicks and like stuff out of that because it's so true online. It's just a constant the culture war. Um, It's almost like it's by design in a way, like just to like distract people. And because I guess I'm more conspiracy brain than you. But uh, do you think it's possible to break that symbiotic <laughs> relationship at all? Or is it just impossible? <laughs> One way to have it is, is to have a truly independent labor um, movement. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that means it, this is more of a kind of now turning to the left and punching punching left, having mm -hmm. punched right sufficiently, I think. Um, you know, the degree to which, as a result in part of the GOP being so hostile to labor's cause, organized labor's cause, uh, the labor movement ha has completely been absorbed into the Democratic Party and its various kind of NGOs and, and um, magazines and so forth, and on uh, media organs. And uh, with with the result that that labor doesn't speak with an independent enough voice when this kind of thing happens, they're like, well, I, you know, the Democratic Party is for maximal reproductive rights, whatever you think of those issues with like abortion or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, you know, we have to completely go along. And so they get sort of caught in um, the, the sort of trap of the maximal social liberalism, which, by the way, corporations are happy to to accommodate, mm -hmm. but it leaves the, la the the labor movement sort of at the mercy of both the em larger employer and of politicians who, if anything, it's the politicians who should be chasing labor rather than the labor movement sort of being beholden to what democratic politicians do. So that's that's one way to to, uh, to break the symbiosis. The other is just for all of us to be a little bit more um, like you are, basically kind of uh, roll our eyes at seeing these kind of back ping pong culture wars <laughs> I, and i believe me i've i've participated in my share of oh me too i have my time. i have <laughs> my cultural views as as you knows like and are which are you know ferocious and like but that's at some point you come to recognize that there's no there's no progress being made yeah for for the common good in those things it's, it's just mm -hmm. pure kind of fakery and so we have to all be able to you know, as individuals, a little bit roll our eyes at it and move on, because um, otherwise it is this kind of symbi symbiosis in which, you know, grifters on both mm -hmm. sides gets clicks and the assetless few and corporate America continues to sort of uh, wield legitimacy over right and yeah. left. Speaking to the right sort of uh, 
notion of the working class as these small business owners who, like you said, there's probably also a racialized component to it. But it almost still seems very stuck in the past because it, it reminds me of, of the part of Lincoln's address that you that you cite, where the, the idea was for a long time in this country that well, a laborer or a person would be born and they would toil under someone else for a time, accrue surplus or land or tools, and then they too could eventually become something of the business owner or they could employ the new uh, beginners beneath them. But in time, of course, with the rise of the Industrial Revolution and other factors, that really wasn't a, a reality anymore. The promise of, well, if you put your nose to the grind, you too can have a stake in all this. Whereas now we see that people are just wage slaves. I mean, I mean, the, the bulk of our economy is propped up by people who, who are subject to wage slavery. And then on the right, there is this um, refusal to acknowledge it, or there's this ignorance of it. Is it, is it, is it being just stuck in theory of of these think tanks and Ayn Rand novels, or, or or is it financial incentivization? Is it both? I mean, is there a way to wake these people up? Because I'm coming from the right, obviously, and so I can criticize the left and I can say everything I think about the left. But I want to shake people who are ostensibly my allies, right? Into, mm -hmm. into reality. And there are some, I guess, strands of optimism uh, with, with certain elected officials and, and rhetoric at the very least, but it, it seems unshakable. And really after something of a letdown in the 2022 midterms as well, I mean, with the exception of, of Vance, I, I'm less optimistic now than I was two years ago about this sort of realignment. Same, same here, same here. And that's, that's reflected in my remarks here. And sort of in the book's acknowledgement section where I sort of lay out my card and say like, this book was conceived at a moment of optimism. And then what I actually ended up writing is sort of um, more sober. Um, I'm in the same boat. Like two years ago, I really thought like people like you, uh, Yuda and me, were gonna take over the right. And it's gonna be, you know, a, a, a working class right, a, a right that, you know, pays a due respect to uh, ordinary people's yearning for social order and cohesion etc those kind of cultural things that you and i uh you know certainly cherish but that would also take you know that would really solve solve the wounds of people uh wounded by neoliberal economics and sort of abandon the reaganomics but then i watched over the two years hence you know this bizarre th mode of conservatism that rails against wall street but like you, you look under the hood, and it's it would you know its policy platform would redound to the benefits of, of, of Wall Street, right. or a conservatism that rails against big tech, you know, in terms of going on Fox News or creating you know soundbite moments at congressional hearings where you sort of skewer Mark Zuckerberg, but then actually doesn't pursue any of the policy agenda uh, that would actually rein in big tech power. More than that, meanwhile, you know. I have to admit, it's like Senator Warren, Liz Warren, who has, a, I think, a decent plan called the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, mm -hmm. which is one of the issues in this book about what one kind of coercion is the way that uh, Wall Street corrodes the real economy. The real economy is where we like, you know, build stuff, build stuff, and right. services that are useful to ordinary people, the people, things that people would recognize as a useful thing. Uh, that part of the economy over the past two generations has become much more subservient to the financial side of the economy yeah. where people, the more I sort of, it, it's funny, it's one of those like IQ curves where it's like, you know, the, the supposedly dumb person is like, this isn't, this isn't anything useful. This is nonsense. And the like the high IQ person right. on the other end is like, this isn't real stuff. It's all nonsense. Only the sort of the midwit who's like, oh yeah, derivatives are totally useful to the economy. You know, the more research I do, the more I come back to the simple view is like, what, you know, what are you doing with, you're just moving money around, you know, yeah. mainly out of the real economy into your own asset ledgers. Uh, this is this is just corrosion. So then I sometimes look at the left and center left. I'm like, okay, Warren has that plan. Lena Khan, who's used to be on the uh, on the Congressional Democratic staffer, the FTC, a lot of, right? It's now the uh, President Biden's um, competitions are at the Federal Trade Commission. They're like they're like doing serious stuff about this stuff. Meanwhile, the so-called right populists just 
you know, they talk about big tech at Wall Street, but these are like cultural signifiers for them. It's right. nothing to actually do anything about. So I don't know. Do I, but to answer your question, do I see shoot green shoots or signs of hope? Well, one is if, if any of these people are really serious about holding on to the new crop of working class voters who are voting for the GOP, they have to deliver. And see, here's where I have a small, a small, but persistent kind of small D democratic faith is that working class people are smart. And after a while, if you just kind of peddle fakery, they, they sense through that. I argue that the 2022 midterms was already a sign that they mm. like weren't excited about what the Republican Party was offering on these kind of material issues. Sure. Um, so they, they have to do that. And I think there are there are lawmakers out there whom I think you know, do I endorse every single thing they stand for? No, but I think they they mean the rhetoric and they want to do right. And they're trying within the constraints of the modern Republican Party. So I'll name names. I think Marco Rubio, you know, is definitely on the right track here. And he's, he's one who's probably the most serious on this stuff. Senator Josh Hawley, Senator J.D. Vance. Sure. Now, I know a lot of left people will like hear that and say, oh, but, you know, J.D. doesn't support XYZ Act. And I know that like, or doesn't speak about these issues the exact way that we on the left would want them to speak. But I think you have to like give people credit and see, notice that they're really trying to come along. We talked about sort of uh, some disappointments on the right, especially in the past few years. I know June sort of as an analog to myself and maybe to you too, had frustrations with the left. I liked this book a lot because a lot of the frustrations I've had for a long time were um, pretty much laid out in a much smarter way than I could have. I liked having my uh, opinions validated by people who <laughs> like know more of what they're talking about. But um, but I came to these conclusions like years ago, and I what you call lifestyle leftists. People have many names for these people: SJWs. The left calls them woke scolds. Um, but we all know like the type of people that you're describing and they're really disappointing because I feel like a lot of their energy isn't where it should be. And uh, how would you describe a lifestyle leftist for those unaware? So I have to give credit where it's due. Um, and in the book I do, the term itself, I borrow from the leader of Germany's left party, Zara Wagenecht, who um is an old school social democrat basically is <laughs> so an old school leftist and what she means by lifestyle leftism is basically a leftism that is obsessed with um policing people's consumer behavior ordinary people's consumer behavior or the kind of language that they use um rather than you know the old school commitments of the of the left toward building a society that's mm -hmm where exploitation is a little bit less rife, where ordinary people just are able to live more comfortable lives and aren't so harried and um, miserable, you know, it's not that hard. And um, so, I mean, examples of that include, uh, I give this one example, which is kind of infamous on the left, but it's a really apt one. There's a reason for it, which is, you know, the outdoor chain, um, outdoor gear chain, REI, uh, had a podcast not too long ago, just a few months ago, um, led by their chief diversity officer. And she began by saying, hi, my name is so-and-so. I use she, her pronouns. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the alone people. And the topic of the podcast was why you shouldn't join a labor union. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, a, yeah, that's, a, that's... Such, a, such a blatant example of it, and there's much more subtle versions. But the, the bottom line is that, um, as as Wagenek argues, first of all, you know, constantly dividing people by the like ever more boutique and exotic identitarian forms of identification. Well, actually, that makes it harder to build workplace solidarity, right? Like that's mm -hmm. good for bosses. It you know you can divide up people ever more. And everyone feels like they're, I don't have in common anything with my fellow workers or people who are situated consumers, et cetera, because I'm such and such, I'm gay, black, da da da, da they're white, this, that. Mm -hmm. And so it hinders solidarity. And it also lends legitimation to, you know, 
gross policies on the part of corporate America. Like in this case, like I don't, I don't want a union, but you know, I, you know, I'm actually a really good person because I right. use yeah. share pronouns and I, I, I do land acknowledgements before mm-hmm. I go on my union busting rant. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, another example I think you gave on, on the same page or right around there was about um, Carolyn Maloney, the progressive lawmaker from New York. And there was a story about uh, corporate CEOs who make, you know, $200 million or something. And her response to this was, where are the women? It, it wasn't, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't, why, why do we have these people making $211 million a year? It's, well, why aren't women making it too? Mm-hmm. There, there's, they, there's no even, it's almost like the water in which they swim. They've given up asking, how did we get to this point of such gross, gross inequality here? Uh, and yeah. now it's just, well, why can't women also be plutocratic oppressors, right? It's, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's no, that's a really, that's a really good one. And, you know, again, like, you know, my ideal, what I, what I argue for, I'm, I'm not a, I, I'm ultimately, my ultimate commitment, so I'm a, I'm a Catholic. And so I'm not a, I'm not a socialist. I don't favor, you know, the abolition of private property or full, you know, state ownership of every enterprise. I think there are things that markets do well and we learn that. Um, but that I, I just think that politics should overwrite market imperatives, not in every case, but but when they come into cl- uh, clash, the common good is more important. This is an old kind of social democratic, Christian yeah. democratic um, ideal. And, and so he, again, going back to the sort of high watermark era of of that worldview, the New Deal era in the United States. It's not like bosses weren't making more money than their workers. I mean, there's somewhat inevitable, and I think anyone who's realistic will see that. But there's something obviously different from like a boss making, you know, five hundred thousand dollars a year compared to workers who make fifty thousand dollars a year, mm-hmm. versus the boss making two hundred and eleven million dollars a year, which was the highest one in that chart that. Carolyn Maloney, sorry, Mahoney was responding to 211 versus workers making on average like 36,000 mm-hmm. precarious without health, good health care, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, yes. And, and then to, to, to the response, well, where are the girl bosses here? Right, right. <laughs> where are the girl bosses? Exactly. Yeah. That's like a huge part of my whole, like I've been mocking that for like, I don't even know, nine years now. I know. Um, I know. But yeah. uh, these, this part in your book, see how much I've highlighted it? Because I was like so, ex- <laughs> I was so excited. I was like so excited about this. But you praise um, social democracy a lot. Um, I know I sort of touched on this, but that's basically my ideology because I don't think America could even be a socialist country. And even if it did, I feel like it would just do it really terribly and it would just be awful. But um, so I tend to be more social democratic because I feel like it's a more realistic goal for us. And we've seen it work all around the world. And we've seen it work here, like um, in part, sort of what you were saying, like uh, during the New Deal era. And around this time where you're praising social democracy, you talk a little about uh, neoliberalism. And you describe it as like the anti-homeless rainbow bench, which is perfect. That's always my go-to, like the the gay bench with the anti-homeless like <laughs> things on it. It's like it's so perfect. But um, can you go into like a little bit, like just a small summary about like how you think neoliberalism has just been so poisonous, um, and kind of like helped destroy the social democratic thing we had going on for a little while. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I did. I in the book I kind of give a. It's useful. Anyone who wants a an economic history, I think even even libertarians will read this and they'll draw different conclusions from it. Obviously, but they would roughly agree with this kind of tripartite economic story that I give. Mm-hmm. Uh, are, so the classically ec- liberal economy was premised idea on the idea that. Um, the state should leave most economic activity alone, that the market uh, should be autonomous from, you know, other con- concerns like common good, et cetera. And that was a dramatic departure from basically most sort of Western civilization, most uh, classical and Christian ideas of how to, how to structure the relationship between markets and, and societies and governments. Now, bear in mind that in order to bring about the autonomous market, in fact, the earliest sort of 
uh, market elites use tremendous state coercion, right? It's not like markets just happen. They don't grow on trees. Um, there were lots of communitarian forms of getting along that had persisted for a long time, which had to be actively destroyed. So the most famous example of this, of course, is the enclosure controversy in, in early modern England. Prior to that, you know, uh, peasants had these sort of common lands which they, where they could which they, they could graze. And then you had essentially enterprising noblemen who then became kind of proto-capitalists mm -hmm. taking this land coercively and using it for commercial farming. And that proletarianized lots of former peasants who had lived in dignity uh, beforehand and it just disrupted whole ways of rural ways of life. Now, I'm not saying you should romanticize rural ways of life, but just to note that the market system that we know did not come about organically or naturally it was a result of policy choices mm -hmm. uh, but then okay the the, mar the autonomous market is established and it's there and the idea of classical liberalism is you know don't interfere with it leave it to be as competitive as it can be normally but that created all sorts of problems right so for example in the united states version of it um the 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 competitive model led to all sorts of problems of over of overproduction like in the railroad industry just a fourth of railroads went bankrupt in the third quarter of the 19th century. Why? Because everyone was competing and they were all uh, trying to undercut each other on price, which is the kind of classic competitive model. And that just led to bankruptcies and disasters. Um, it led to obviously the ultimately the depression because workers weren't getting paid enough to afford the things they were producing. So it created a demand crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So then in that, out of that cauldron of two world wars and global depression, this idea came about of, of social democracy and then the right adopted various versions of it, Christian democracy in Europe, Nixon Eisenhower tradition on the GOP, basically accepting the new deal. And what was the idea is that, yes, you're going to have markets, but there are various things we need to do to um, constrain their destructive effects. So, um, above all, it meant that workers should have greater say mm -hmm. to be able to have greater bargaining power for over wages because then they can actually afford the, the things that they produce. And mm -hmm. you had this 30 years defined by high unionization, great degree of collaboration between um, uh, business, you know, management, labor and the government coordinate economic life. Again, you still had, this was not Stalinism or anything. You still had, you know, private enterprise, but you, there was just greater coordination between state, society, and market. Mm -hmm. And then the neoliberals all along were like cranks during this period. They were considered fringe. Uh, the business elite themselves knew that like the social democratic way of doing things was the consensus way but they plugged away at their ideas. And sometimes it's not that the ideas become more persuasive with age like cheese. It's just that social democracy in the 1970s created uh, or, or led to certain crises. I argue they were not world shattering crises, they, uh, but that, that created an opening for a group of politicians beginning with Carter actually in the United States, but especially Reagan, Thatcher and Britain to implement a wholesale kind of new model to to displace the new deal order or the social democratic order and the difference between this new thing that came about compared with classical liberal model was that it's not just that no longer it's no longer that the state would leave markets autonomous now going forward politics had to resemble the market right. Even the market governs everything else as well mm -hmm. so that you you know the market-based metrics proliferate in how we even you know, govern things that you wouldn't even think of. Uh, transactions uh, or, or sort of human relationships that you never thought about as financial relationships become marketized. So for example, uh, the takeover of public goods like water or emergency services, yeah. firefighting, as I write about in the book, by private actors, um, policing, even privatization, uh, health becoming uh, privatized pregnancy in the form of surrogacy becoming privatized. So it's it's this it's this deeper counterattack by the forces of kind of market fundamentalism, where it's not just like leave markets alone. It's the market will also invade what used to be thought of as public by all ordinary people, and that's the I think the best way to summarize what neoliberalism is, which is a common term that's used, but um, 
we have to have a good definition of it. And so the one I have, which I borrow from the political theorist Wendy Brown, is neoliberalism seeks to govern society by the market rather than just leaving the market alone. Right. It, it, it makes it renders the state almost subservient to or subordinate to the market. The state exists to facilitate market um, functions rather mm -hmm. than rather than a check on market functions or even just coexisting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I thought was very sort of a good way that you put this throughout the book was that neoliberalism is based on a completely false anthropology or false understanding of what it is to even be a human being. Like you said just now, it renders these human relations, which we never would have thought of uh, in economic terms, we would have thought them in social terms, maybe political in a certain sense of the word, but certainly not economic or contractual relations. It's based on a, a, a fiction of what it is to be a human and what it is to have a society. And like you said, it's, it's very clearly a top down project. This was not a natural organic outflow. And I, I really like the Thatcher quote that you put in there where, where she said, society it doesn't exist or something like that like there there mm -hmm. is no such thing as a society to the neoliberal worldview it's rather a series of market functions which the state just exists to facilitate and yeah. and that's it just got such a stranglehold right now and i guess like you like you know people in this camp will sort of say the right liberals and the left liberals uh they all adhere to the same thing in that regard there are signs that neoliberalism is on the way, at least at the level of elite ideology. Um, this has been going on for a couple of years, in part because of um, its free trade model was revealed to be so devastating during the pandemic when mm -hmm. um, suddenly there was this realization, oh, wait, like the material production matters, that there's, you know, you, you, that there isn't some deep wisdom in trading away manufacturing capacity for just services and finance. Uh, that was revealed by the pandemic and again by the Ukraine war, which is a kind of industrial war. It's like, oh, hey, we need to like be able to create, make rail and, and tanks and, you know, munitions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's one factor. And the, 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 the sort of the thinness of these capillary supply chains too was revealed to be really terrifying. You know, you can't, deliver stuff because uh you know the goal of neoliberalism is maximizing efficiency but it's no good if you just can't get anything across across these great distances when you could as a as an alternative you could have like closer manufacturing that is nearer to us and right. actually is better for our workers um and so there are signs you know um, most notably uh uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, gave this speech. I think now it's been, we were recording this in early August. I think it was uh, earlier in the summer or late spring, if I'm not mistaken, in which he argued that the Washington consensus, which is a, is a, is a byword for neoliberalism, has been a failure at home and abroad. Um, there are elements of the Biden administration, I would argue, that point this way. The fact that he hasn't lifted any of the tariffs against China, the fact that uh, he's insistent on uh, reshoring manufacturing, the Chips Act, et cetera. These are these are some signs, but the, the fact is that unless you know we demand a better way as a, as an alternative, neoliberalism can like last a long time as the prevailing governing nationality of the West in the absence of an alternative. Even if there are these little signs that I mentioned, these bits of uh, elite dissatisfaction and so on. We, like there has to be a popular demand for something else, and so you know that's that's important for populists on the right and left to keep up the pressure. You, one of the main characteristics of, of neoliberalism, beyond what you've sort of talked about already here, is depoliticization. Right, the depoliticization of of society, uh, even even politically. Because I remember earlier in the book, you uh, you cite I think it's Elizabeth Anderson talking about even private government, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that when we talk about something as private, it really just means that the people who are subject to its authority don't have a say in how it's operated. Mm -hmm. So we have a maybe a private government and private, um, obviously private corporations, and we're sort of subject to both authorities without much input to how they operate. And perhaps the private government is subordinate to the private corporations under neoliberalism. But in all, it's it's still identified largely by depoliticization. Uh, so to sort of 
bring things to a solution, it would it requires, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, a revitalization of the political in, in and I guess the more traditionally understood political realm, but also sort of bringing back politicization of the workplace in the sense of folks having a say in how things are run and bringing back equilibrium on both sides of the supply and demand of labor equation. Is that right? No, that's right. So um, there's this kind of larger level of we need to have greater say over over our of these kind of private behemoths that otherwise get to dictate so much about our lives. Um, and that just means a revival of politics in the United States. That's me a revival of democratic politics. You know, I'm um, I'm deeply interested in the Jacksonian era and um, as a sort of precursor or or a foreshadow of what we face today and uh, specifically President Jackson's and the Jacksonians war against the second bank of the United States. There was much that was misguided about about how the Jacksonians fought that institution, whether they should have fought it or not. You know, it was a congressionally chartered bank, but it was a privately run company for its own benefit. And so it, it wielded tremendous influence over the economy. And yet ordinary people felt like they had no control over this institution. And so the Jacksonians smashed it. We can get into whether or not that was an effective move. In some ways, it wasn't. It created just sort of this crisis of wildcat banking and, and, and currency destabilization. But what the Jacksonians asserted was, I think, is more important than what they failed at, which what they asserted was that politics is more ultimately more important than the economy, that the economy is a tool. The, econ the market is a tool. It's not this god. It's not this uh, natural, inevitable institution to whose demands we just must bow. That we're human beings. We can make. Po we are political animals, and we can make political choices. And so that's what I mean in a larger sense. But a, a, in a more immediate sense, on this particular kind of condition that we find ourselves in, I think that that the New Deal order or social democracy, whatever you want to call it had the right answer in terms of um, at the level of the workplace, at the level of industry, the um, workers need to have greater power and that there's getting, there needs to be greater uh, balance. And this is, this is the idea of class compromise, which is central to the New Deal order and central to what I'm arguing for. And again, why I'm not a full-on socialist, I don't want to wage class war to the point of one class destroying the other, but rather you know, achieving a class compromise that's more balanced. And this doesn't come about naturally. I don't believe it's enough to have like better elites or elites who are more humane. Class mm. compromise has to come about as a result of agitation from the other side. And you know, our, we have some legislation from the New Deal that's still left over, some of it like the Wagner Act and Fair Labor Standards Act, but some of it we need to maybe rethink. Uh, you know, the Wagner Act, for example, does unionization at the level of each shop. So if you want to unionize your workplace, and it's a corporate business, you only do your own branch. And that exactly. is exhausting for everyone, right? It's, it's, it's exhausting for workers. It's, it's a battle royal every time. It it's wastes a lot of energy at the corporate level. Whereas if you have sectoral or regional bargaining, it's not like every worker has to be a militant. You, if you get a job in XYZ industry, you just are assumed to be part of that union. And once a year, you know, management and, and labor and government meet and sort of set conditions and wages and so forth. Uh, but the point is that... Uh, what the New Dealers did was to raise up the countervailing power of, of lots of groups, consumers, et cetera, but especially workers. And this isn't so much different from competition, right? Uh, even laissez-faire types agree that government must intervene when there's a monopoly hindering competition. But here, what all you're doing is government taking action to allow competition on the other side of the market. Here's what right. I mean by that that you, normally competition you think of as between sellers or between buyers. Here, co the competition is between sellers of labor, that's workers, going up against buyers of labor, that's employers. And so if you think it's okay for government to intervene to make sure there's competition between sellers or between buyers, then it's also okay for competition on the other side of a market. And this is just the simplest insight of the New Deal order, which can be revived today 
um, through policy, through uh, bolstering Wagner Act or thinking of something more robust so that more workers are able to have a greater say in how we run our, how, how they run their companies and ultimately how we run our economy. It's it, so I'm, I'm, it's funny because I'm often accused of being like a radical, you know, or what have you in terms of my diagnosis. But the people who read this book, and I, I think you, you'll agree with this, Yuda, is that I'm, I'm actually much more of a humdrum reformer than people think because I right. am trying yeah. to, I'm trying to work with this American tradition and there, I just find much that's good in it, actually. When I say American tradition, I don't mean this kind of, you know, airbrush version of the founding. I include the Jacksonians and I include, you know, Williams Jennings, Jennings Bryant, and I include, you know, FDR and Eisenhower. This is the living American tradition is very interesting and it has a lot more resources than we think. I feel like the first politician to call themselves either like a new, a new deal Democrat or a new deal Republican and like run for president would win instantly. <laughs> like... mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I just think that it's, well, first of all, I, I think you're right. Although I hope it's not the false optimism of a group like us three, right? Um, <laughs> you know, but uh, but I, I am made to agree that that's, there's a real vacuum there. And so I, I have optimism too. But going back to what you said, Saurabh, about sort of preserving or, or, or um, having the government take a role in preserving competition on both sides of that equation, because that's something that the neoliberal consensus, and especially on the American right faction of that neoliberal consensus, is very allergic to. You know, they pretend to a kind of laissez-faire, hands-off approach uh, until it comes to protecting one side of that equation of the competition. And then, and then it's very much um, everything is socialism, the government doing anything is Stalinist, right, X, Y, Z. And so I think that there is uh, there's room to move there, and uh, I'm I'm optimistic uh, because I think that there comes a certain point where you have to just sort of put down the the fountainhead and uh, and actually look at what's going on, and so I, I hope that the American right and the American left can can come to that, and I think that Jim, you uh, you had some exposure to some of what he talks about the book with Christian Smalls, right? Is that right? Yeah. With, um, um. Well, I don't want to give too many spoilers for the book okay. but um there's a few times in the book where you do this like funny bait and switch thing where you did it in your steubenville speech as well and um there was one part in your speech and in your book where you're talking about china and you're like oh look at those terrible things what they do to their workers and i'm listening to you say this and i'm i'm reading it too um and i'm like wait this sounds like really familiar and it's like lol just kidding this was actually america and this was christian smalls mm -hmm. and i actually have seen christian smalls speak twice um once i was at a healthcare march in uh, new york city and the other time i went to the staten island amazon work house like the warehouse um and i saw him speak there and it, i have a, i got a picture with him and everything and it was actually much easier to get a picture with aoc than it was with christian smalls because like nobody was coming up to aoc for some reason but everyone was like so excited about christian smalls there was like a lot of good energy there um but yeah i liked that bait and switch you also did it where you're like oh and then mark said this about class lol just kidding that was actually pope leo the 13th or and i think that's a really good way to kind of hook people in like i guess on the right um like the more libertarian right kind of hook them in and like make them listen because some of them just won't listen to any criticism against american corporations because that's socialism you know that's right. communism. so i thought that was really um interesting and a really a really good tactic yeah i mean so yeah i mean this is this is again a cause dear to my heart but I, I, I get so frustrated because I'm like, if you actually read the, the tradition that you claim to revere, um, you know, here I'm talking about specifically Catholics. There's a kind of Catholic who is, you know, super conservative when it comes to, you know, cultural issues and lit their liturgical preferences. You know, uh, the, the, the Tridentine mass was already too reformed for them or what have you. Um, but then when it comes to like political economy, they're Barry Goldwater or, or Ayn Randians. And it's like, well, look, look at what the popes say. It's not that the popes, the popes recognized in the, in the 19th century that there is class antagonism and that it typically goes in one direction. In other words, mm -hmm. the, 
it's one one side of that uh, antagonism that bears the brunt of the brunt of it. Um, the, they recognize this, but if it, so, if I quote it and I say this marks, you know, you'll shake your head. But what what do you make of it if I tell you that's actually Pope Leo the Thirteenth who um, who said that? And another, I mean, it's like uh, you know, I'm now getting into this this next project that has to do with 19th century America. And again, you read the Jacksonians, you know, you read Roger Taney, uh, you read uh, Amos Kendall. These are kind of 19th century populist figures. And, and if I don't tell you it's who the speaker is, and I read you the quote about class oppression, you would say it's Lenin who said that. So well, it's almost like the book though, because like, if you, if I didn't tell these leftists who responded to me on Instagram, like, oh, it's another conservative talking about blah, 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 blah. I don't want to read it, like, pass. If I didn't tell them this was written by, by a conservative, just give it to them. They would just think it's a really good book. Like, mm -hmm. But it, it challenges, you really challenge people's biases. You had a really good tweet, sorry. But I retweet it. I unretweet it and re-retweet it every so often. Uh, and I, I don't have it pulled up, but it's, it's basically neoliberalism turns what otherwise might be interesting leftists into neoliberal butlers or something like that. You, I, that's, yeah. I think that's my favorite tweet of all time or my favorite post, I guess. Well, we call I've them seen now. it happen firsthand well, with many friends of mine. So. Well, and that's, that's sort of what I was, you know, you take these online leftists, especially, and they are sort of, they, they, there were, a t there was a time where a lot of these folks online and, and outside of the internet on the left had interesting and, and productive critiques of our system. I don't know what happened after 2020. I don't know if it was Trump, I don't know what broke their brains, but a lot of them, both online and in real life, have become these ardent defenders of, of, of the neoliberal order. They are neoliberal butlers. And so, and yeah, your tweet, I think it's like a year and a half old now, uh, but it's it just, it, to see that happen in real time, it's this opposition to, like, I think your tweet said politics or defense of, defense of democracy or something. They sort of cloud their neoliberal butler status in this hollow defense of democracy um but what they really do is is they are the ones who subvert it by defending this system that is completely uh unpolitical it's it's completely depoliticized because it, it has to be because the market functions control everything so i just think that's a really interesting way that neoliberalism i guess insidiously convinces people these otherwise interesting leftists that they are defending democratic systems when in reality they're actually doing the exact opposite. Uh, so I thought I read that I was thinking about that tweet the whole time I was reading the, the neoliberalism chapter. Yeah, I mean, and, and so when they say, when you hear the defense of, defense of democracy, um, often recently it's been uh, that kind of rhetoric where it's well, there's X Y Z person advocating this and that in the democratic public square that should be suppressed using the combined power of Silicon Valley and other corporations and you know the security apparatus that should give you know people on the left that should make their hair stand on end because yes right now that's being used against um so and so populist right winger you don't like tomorrow that same mechanism could be used against a, a, a left populist in fact it has been it has been for a long time and so uh, that the short sightedness of, of um, saying, well, like Google is suppressing my enemy, therefore it's okay. Look, what do you, what, what do you say in response to that? You say, response to that is that these platforms are too important. They should be um, yeah. treated like, like common carriers. Yeah. I always say that these people, like, they can't see past next Thursday, right? They like that, oh, my enemies are being suppressed. Like, oh, this is a good thing. But I've been saying for years, like, okay, but then, you know, there's we have an election, like, every four years, first of all. So why do you pretend, like, everything will be totally fine and going your way for the whole time? Like, they can't see into the future where these things they're cheering on will be used against them, like you said. And um, I was saying that about Twitter for years, like, in videos in, like, 2020. Like, oh, you're, like, celebrating this these people being suppressed but you know who knows where big tech is going in the future and now elon musk owns it so like, <laughs> you never know and it's just it's so we we need like the freedom of speech online and to break up you know big tech big tech monopolies and stuff like that and they just they don't care because 
at the moment it it benefits them and it's it's a little frustrating to see that you talk about the citizens united case uh which you know in, in the uh the majority found that corporations have the free speech and can spend the unlimited uh, money on political campaigns and there's a line that you quote whether the speaker is a homeless woman or exxon speech is speech just as capital is capital but of course exxon is not a homeless woman and that's really just the only retort that I think is necessary at this point is we've been operating under this fiction that Exxon is no different than a homeless woman. But if you actually just put down the books and open your eyes, you can actually determine that Exxon and a homeless woman are not the same. And, 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 a, and a decent political order would take cognizance, cognizance of that. And there's all sorts of things that follow from taking cognizance of that difference rather than treating, you know, speech, access, fairness, et cetera, as these um, purely kind of marketized um, concepts. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to uh, have any sort of closing remark for folks who might be interested or? I'd love to just briefly say that this is, I, I, as she mentioned already, so I, I, I apologize for just repeating what she said, but this is not a tirade against woke capital it's actually just a tirade against the, the workings of unhindered capital as such, regardless of what kind of ideology or mm -hmm. ideological garb it puts on. Absolutely. And it, and it was a fantastic one. It was, it was yeah, a real I pleasure to read. Highly, highly recommend it to my audience, especially like if you like the things I say in videos and Twitter and have been saying for years. Yeah. Read it. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's, that's tyranny Inc. How private power crushed American Liberty and what to do about it by Saurabh Amari. Saurabh, thank you so much for talking with us here. I know that you're doing a whole tour of these uh, sort of shows, podcasts, etc. So best of luck as you continue that tour. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks I for really your time. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank no, thank you.